Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to talk about finding interesting work in the quant space here. Uh, more specifically on the actual research, development, model development side of this. So um, not HFT, well, I don't know if you wanna say HFT or not, but not quant dev. Like we're not focusing on trading, we're not focusing on quant dev. Um, and I'm gonna read two questions here and then you can kind of get the gist of what we're going at. Um, Abstract Schnitzel uh, posted, so big shout out to him. He's been a long, long time subscriber of this channel. Um, he asked a question you've mentioned in this video in previous videos that smaller firms typically don't have as much meaningful real quant work. Do you generally find this to be different outside of banks? I'm curious since you work for a fintech company smaller than most regional banks and seem to have more quant work there. So I made a point in a previous video uh, that typically when you look for like really interesting model development, statistics and math focused jobs, um, go to the big banks. But then as you kind of scale down smaller firms, especially regional banks, for example, um, especially things that are like FDIC regulated, uh, there's like credit unions, regional banks, all that, you're not going to get the same amount of interesting rigor and work in the quant space here. Um, and I'm talking specifically about the banks. Um, and then I'm gonna read uh, Bastiza 98's question as well, because I think these two questions are similar. They tie into the same answer here. The Steezen 98 says, Dimitri, what roles, job titles should I target if I want to do what you do? Heavy in math and stats, sit down and think deeply about problems. I'm a first year MFE student trying to figure out where I fit best. So again, Dimitri, where do you find this interesting, rigorous work and how do you end up in these jobs and what roles are they, right? It's kind of the same question. Firm size is one um, that's gonna play into this a little bit, which I'll talk about. Uh, but the reality is I don't really have a super like bulletproof way of like do this and you will get into this really great firm. So it's hard. It is hard. Uh, one thing I emphasize a lot on this channel is going to be look at the skills on the job postings. Uh, so to start with here, job titles mean absolutely nothing. They mean nothing, um, right? I, I'm, I hire, I work at a, at a FinTech, um, as Abstract Schnitzel mentioned. I can create any job title in the world I want. I could create a job title of, you know, I don't know, Senior Vice President of Super Quanty Things and Fun Times at this company. Uh, right, I mean, HR is probably gonna have a little bit of a, a say on, on how we, we name them, but to be honest with you, I can name it anything I want. I could have someone uh, just adding numbers for me on a piece of paper and say, oh, it's a quant. Um, or I could have someone doing accounting and I could say, oh, they're doing rigorous quantitative finance and corporate finance, uh, machine learning, AI in this magical world and I could wave my hands and make any title. Um, unfortunately, most firms do this, right? I mean, and I'll give you an example of why this occurs and why it's not necessarily people trying to be bad, um, but this is what ends up happening. So a firm goes out and they say, okay, we need to hire a bunch of people to do work for us. And it's very quantitative, it's a lot of math. And so it's like, okay, okay. Um, what are we gonna do? And they, HR goes online or the some executive or team lead or, I don't know, I'm not gonna put any negative comments here. I was gonna throw in a negative one here, but uh, no jabs today, I'll try to minimize these. Uh, they go out and they try to find some sort of, you know, job title. They don't know what it's called. They, right, they're in a different department, an executive, a team lead, HR, like they don't do quant work and they say, we need someone to do, you know, really, really rigorous analytics. Like they need to take all of our data and they need to get insights from it. And they search online and they just happen to come across an article, a video, a job posting. They go, wow, this job requires a PhD and a master's. It says they do lots of high-end rigorous analytics and modeling and statistics and math. And you know, a PhD is preferred. Oh, this looks amazing. Okay, what is this job called? And they say, okay, quantitative researcher. This is exactly what we need. And then they put quantitative researcher and then they post the job and then they go out there and they look for candidates. Now, what ends up really happening is you end up posting this, a bunch of people apply, um, you interview a bunch of people and no one really fits because uh, what you listed and what the job's even posted as isn't really what you're looking for. Um, or you hire someone, which many, many people on this channel, you can put in the comments below, I'd love to hear your stories. Uh, you can put in there about how you, you got a job, right? Quantitative analyst, um, quantitative model developer, and you worked quantitative uh, model validation, like something like that. You did this job, you know, for a year and you're like, 
this is not what I signed up for, right? This is like simple analytics. This is not a quant job. I'm not using any of the skills I learned in grad school. Like, what the hell am I doing here? Um, and often you're desperate for a job. And so typically these jobs will pay less, but you're like, I just need to get my foot in the door. And sometimes guys, it sucks, but sometimes it's true. It's just getting the foot in the door, doing some nonsense, trying to polish it up to look better than it is and get a job posted uh, and try to find that next opportunity here. But often the job titles don't mean anything. Um, as I'm kind of hinting at too, a lot of times even the roles with HR, the hiring manager's post isn't great. Um, so a lot of this is gonna have to be done in the interview process of asking like, what is a daily job of this individual look like? Um, what are you like trying to accomplish, right? Especially with small firms. What is the goal here? What are you guys trying to reach? I think that's something that not enough people ask, myself included. I should have asked this at many of the firms I've interviewed at. Um, so again, if you want to end up in this, there's not really a super easy, simple way of saying, hey, um, go get a job at a specific type of firm or anything. It's going to be challenging. Now, let's switch back over here to abstract credentials question, more specifically on size of firm, because we're kind of hinting at this with jobs. Um, large banks have the highest level of scrutiny out of the banks. Okay. So when you go up the scale, the bottom, the very bottom is going to have like CFPB, which is the Consumer Finance, Financial Protection Bureau. And they kind of have reign over anything and everything financial related and consumer related. And that's going to scale up. And FDIC is kind of in there too. FDIC is more like an official reg. Um, CFPB is a newer one, um, organizational body here. And it's going to rank up into things like the FRB, the Federal Reserve Board, which is the highest. And you have the OCC as well. So Again, when you kind of go up through these ranks here, it's just, it's mandated that you have more rigor. Uh, and let me get here on a second to some history. Um, also, the closer to a financial crisis you are after it, um, typically the more quant the job's going to be, especially when we look back at my career here, starting right after uh, the 2000, uh, you know, 2004, 2010, you know, financial crisis. I started in 2014, so about a four-year gap, which seems like a long time, but it really isn't. Uh, regulations hit, Dodd-Frank not hit in 2010. Um, four years to really figure this out, right? 2007, 2008 financial crisis. Apologies, the date here. Uh, and then 2010, though, that's when the regulations hit. And then four years out in 2014, when I started, we saw a lot of like ramp up. So 2010 was like new regulation. No one knows what's going on. By 2014, uh, companies are like, we need masters and PhDs in math and stats and financial engineering. And we're going to put them to great use here and make great models. And we're going to meet all these regulatory requirements. And everyone is gung ho. Um, but as time progresses, as we're further away from that, uh, unfortunately, the industry is starting to sag. So regulations have been pulled back a bit. Firms don't really care anymore, right? I'm still making money. Why do I care about having this really high, rigorous, academic level um, sort of rigor in our models and our validation teams? Like, let's just meet the requirements, check the boxes and be done with it. And I partially understand that perspective. I lean a lot more towards pro-regulation in the banking side, which is very odd because I started out very anti-regulation. And I'm still fairly outspoken on many of the regulations, I think, which are nonsense. Um, but there are good benefits that have come with that. With Dodd-Frank, even though it's been a complete disaster and there's been a lot of issues with it, um, there have been some goods that have came out of this. Model risk management has been probably the best thing that's come out of this. And oddly enough, it seems to be ahead of the curve of other industries. Uh, and it's made really rigorous jobs and model development here. Now, looking at size, as I'm talking about, as you're going down the smaller banks, let's turn this into generalized companies as well and look at other industries with this. Um, again, size doesn't really apply to other areas that are not as regulated here. So when you think about like in, on the buy side, the investing side, big investment firms, hedge funds, um, they're still going to be regulated. Again, I'm not an expert in the regulations of all this, but often when you're trading on an exchange, you all have the same sort of regulations when you are a corporation here. Now, again, I'm not going to get down the rabbit hole of legals of you know how you incorporate and how you assign them and how you do all that. That's a whole other story here. But as you go down firm size as well, um, you do see this, but you don't see this. So again, you can have big funds, big firms with big marketing teams, and they can say quantitative finance, AI, ML. If you don't believe me, just search online and any single investing fund out there is probably going to be tacking on ML and AI onto everything. Um, and at the end of the day, they're just doing like a simple average on the background and they're calling this a model. And then they're saying it's quantitative finance. Uh, but there's going to be big firms. There's going to be small firms. Now, as you go down the firms as well here, there is some sort of differentiation and challenge here. Um, big firms have more money, which is a resource. Uh, big firms can train new talent. So they can bring in talent and they can train it. 
If you are not doing quant finance, you don't need to do that much training. I am sorry if you're on the finance side. I can train you to do general finance very fast and very easy. The rigor of it's very low. The material does not build. I can bring in almost anybody to do a lot of the traditional finance sort of materials. And yes, it does take some time. There is some training. Now, if you take someone, and I have attempted this. I, I made the mistake. Um, I've seen this happen to somebody else too. After I made the attempt, I tried to save them, but they didn't listen. You take someone who's really interested in quant finance. They work at the firm already. They want to transition into a quant degree, right? They already know the firm. They know the finance. They've kind of seen what we've done, right? You should be able to train them some simple math and stats and get them just going on the baby models. Uh, unfortunately, it's quite challenging and complicated to build models. And they make 100 million mistakes and you're just scratching your head like, how would, why it, there are just so many questions like, what, what are you doing? Why did you make this decision? How is this even possible? And I found myself when I tried to take on this individual and train them and teach them, um, it was just that every single day of me pulling my hair out and screaming internally, but trying to be as nice as possible. I'm like, you're, you're just not qualified to do this. And I had a colleague that did the same thing. We didn't have a need for an employee anymore that was on our team. And my, my, my boss at the time um, agreed to let one of the other employees try to train them. And I was like, don't do it. it, it it's too much work. I know, I know these people. I've worked with them for a while. I know you have too, um, but I've done this. I have failed. You cannot teach people no matter how good their intentions are. It's just too much training here. Um, so big firms have this sort of advantage here, especially on the quant side here. So when you look at some of the really big firms, they have bigger budgets. And this plays in, I guess, to another comment on the Discord channel. I was arguing over something similar with getting top talent. And they said, you know, getting top talent's easy. You just go out there, you find the leading expert in the field, and you pay them a bunch of money, and you know they'll just come over. Um, and I'll talk about this maybe in a separate video here in a second, maybe for the week after, two weeks out in more detail. But there are constraints in budgets and bigger firms can do this, smaller firms cannot. So there is an advantage on a bigger firm, but just because you're a bigger firm does not mean you're quantitative or more quantitative or better. Now on the smaller side of this, what I can say is the variance in quality and rigor and amount of quantitative work will vary wildly. Like blow your mind wildly because you will see again, small firms with a guy that they hired who claimed to be a quant or a data scientist um, who worked in like model governance at a bank or somewhere else or a hedge fund doing, you know, discretionary decisioning of trades or something. And they'll list on there that they built some models, which they didn't really build. They either didn't build them. They were like somebody else built them and they were adjacent. I don't know. I've seen these people. I ran into them um, and they haven't actually done any quant work. And then they convince a small firm who's just desperate to find a good quality quant, but they don't have the budget to hire someone that's really good. So they go out and they take this risk and they bring this person in and they have no idea what quant finance is like or about. So they just trust this individual and knows what's going on. Um, and then they bring in a bunch of people and you join them and you realize there's no, no comprehension of what's going on. It's just like, you know, it's a struggle. So that is the far end on the small firm. On the other end of this, you could end up with someone who's actually really brilliant, like leading expert, um, ends up wanting to do like one thing really, really well, or has worked at a bunch of different firms and feels like they just want a change. They get out of an industry, they join a new industry. Uh, maybe there's a friend as well in the process. Often I see this, like someone's working and you know, they're making big money at a big firm and they're comfortable, everything's fine. And then a friend has a an opening at the smaller firm and they've taken on a team and they're trying to get things going and they bring that friend in, uh, and then you kind of make that transition. Um, finding those people again is extremely challenging and often comes with that networking piece. Like you have to know the people. Um, again, in both scenarios, both questions here, you need to do the question asking, you need to interview. You really need to interview them. Like you need to think about that. Like, you know, talk to them, look at the job postings, try to figure out if it's a real quant job up front, um, and then really get into the details, the nitty gritties, talking to them, asking about the models they're building. Um, People will find with me, I am very math and rigor and theory focused. And this turns a lot of people off because I will flip them the bird when they start asking about machine learning and they get really excited and they're jumping up and down about AI and it's going to solve all of our problems. And I'm like, hold, hold on. Uh, we have this simple problem here. We need to pull out a simple model. We do, uh, Let's not overcomplicate this just for the hell of it. Uh, so anyways. General questions though, again, firms are going to vary a lot. So this is very, very hard. I do find the variance though in smaller firms to be more, at least on the banking side, I cannot speak for the investing side. So if you work on the investing side, 
put a comment below. I'd love to hear what you guys think on your opinions if you're working in the investing side. Um, but again, company size is going to impact resources. There's also just going to be that, you know, finding the right person at a small firm. And it kind of goes with the nice saying that everyone always says, which is you don't quit companies, you quit bad bosses. Um, you also don't find really quantitative, interesting work unless you find an interesting quant to follow and be a part of and join that team here. So um, to answer the question specifically on the smaller company I am at at the FinTech, um, Yes, we do really interesting and rigorous work, and I make it very mathematical. Um, since I have joined, um, I've brought in the first PhD at the firm. I believe there's been no PhDs in the past. Uh, my team is very analytical, very math-driven. Um, again, there are other people at the firm that have undergrads in math, but again, my team has masters and PhDs. We are doing interesting research because I am actually pushing my team and saying, hey, like there's a really cool problem here. Let's go do this. Uh, and then I work with the business units and I'm like, okay, that's that's an interesting problem. We've done this before. Uh, how do we build a standard industry model and take care of this problem? Um, but let's do it at a better rigorous level. Uh, my employees have to fill out my template of documentation. And then I do validations from time to time where I actually have a template for validations and I go through their models and I make commentary on the way they wrote the documentation. So yes, I will nitpick your documentation that you write. Uh, I go through and point out issues with the models. Um, I'm usually involved because our team is so small with the development process throughout every step. So they go and they do work for like a couple weeks or whatever, and they come back and we have some discussions. I let them run free. Um, I trust them. I have good quality employees. I, I make sure that I interview and try to hire the best. Um, but at the end of the day, right, if it, the company did not have me, I I, it's a toss up. I have no idea what would happen. It would depend on who they hired. If they brought somebody else in um, that was very rigorous as well, just keep going on. You'd have really interesting work there. Um, if they brought someone in who was not so rigorous, not so model focused, not so quantitatively focused, um, and again, a lot of fintech firms and smaller companies and even big firms investments are so jazzed with AI and ML right now, uh, I think a lot of firms are kind of jumping off the rails of rigor and analytics and doing things very... I don't know, professionally, rigorously, I'm tired of using the word rigorous here, but very well thought out and methodical and like logical process of developing and challenging and putting all the pieces together. Um, again, it's going to depend a lot on the person here. So tips and tricks, make sure you interview, make sure you ask a lot of questions, ask them what types of models they're using, ask them what type of metrics they're using, ask them if they validate their models, how do they validate their models. Uh, this will give you some insight into what they're doing. Um, I would also get into nitty gritty questions that you are familiar with. So I am very familiar with time series. I've spent a lot of my career doing this. Um, I go down the rabbit hole of stationarity testing and discussions. What most people don't realize is stationarity and ergodic theory in general is very theoretical. And so when I dig deeper, um, you know, people have even criticized me in interviews because, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And I disagree. And I have a PhD and they try to get on their little high horse about it. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah I, I sit and chat these sorts of topics with people that have a PhD just in this one topic that are not in the industry. So getting into the theory of this, trying to understand their depth, for example, um, I do this when I actually interview at companies as well. And I'm a candidate, I'm looking to work somewhere. I will ask them about these questions I'm familiar with, um, dig down the rabbit hole and see if they've ran into similar issues. Or are they just hand wavy and saying, oh, you know, we did this and this and this solved the problem. And, you know, we all have a good time and things are great. And you start to kind of figure this out. Now, as a student, I know this is much more challenging, um, but I would ask about the validation process, if their models are validated, uh, what sorts of models do they build? Um, ask a little bit about their data as well. Like how big is your data set? Like how many rows, so observations, how many variables and columns do you have? This is something that a lot of people don't ask. Uh, and try to get an understanding of what they're trying to model, what are the common problems they're trying to solve, and what sort of model frameworks they're using to get there. Now the buy side is probably gonna go, oh, it's top secret, it's a black box, we can't tell you. Um, and then I would just run like hell because I mean, you're in an interview, they should be able to provide you at least some general processes here. This is not rocket science and not top secret. So anyways, those are my tips and tricks on, you know, looking at jobs, trying to find more quantitative ones. Um, also my opinion here on quant work outside of banks, inside of banks, size and all that, you know, size of the firm and all that. Um, it really just depends on the managers you end up running into and kind of the firm's culture and more specifically that team's culture who's running that quant team. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.